And what we're going to be teaching today, some of it is going to be, perhaps all of it, is going to be things you've heard before, and yet we're going to be understanding again some of the key things about sharing our faith with others. And we're going to conclude this message with some of your testimonies about evangelism and what God has been doing in your life along these lines. In fact, I think when the moment comes for that, I'm going to share something first, something that happened in my life during this last week, and then we'll go onward from there. We begin this message by thinking a little bit about the message of the gospel itself. And if you have your Bibles ready, you might turn to Galatians chapter 1. That'll be a starting point. We'll look for at several places as we go through the teaching here today. Let me talk to you about the message of the gospel. And I'm going to say something very, very elemental here that perhaps all of us know, but I want you to hear this again. And that is that each of us share the condition of Adam and Eve. That is, each of us born into this world guilty before God because of sin. That was true for you. It was true for me. It's been true for every one of us that has ever been born in this world since Adam and Eve. We share a guilt because of our sin that divides us from God and makes us destined for hell. God, in his mercy, has provided one means to overcome that. He gave Jesus Christ as Savior. He gave Jesus Christ to come and pour out his blood to be the payment for our sin. You understand that there is no other means. It's not like there is a plan B and plan C. God said this is the means for redeeming people from their sin, for paying for their sin. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in that way, was my substitute. He paid for my sin. And I am called to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow after him. In those very few words, I have expressed the message of the gospel. It is only Jesus and what he has done. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who saves. This message is one that we are to proclaim and to proclaim everywhere with confidence. The Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, meaning it's for everybody. Once you take the Jews and the Gentiles, you got everybody. And he says, it is the power for salvation for everyone, this message of the gospel. There are people who have grown up in settings where they have either heard something that is not truly the gospel, and as a result have not been saved, and there are also some who have, have heard the gospel, perhaps even put their faith in Christ based on the gospel, and then begun to drift off into something else which is less than the gospel. That's what's being described in Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 6. Some of you are there with me. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, where the Apostle Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Paul says, you heard the message, you originally got the idea of what the gospel teaches, and now you've drifted off into something which is not the gospel. Reading on, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Taking the gospel, twisting it in some way so that it is not any longer the gospel. But even if we, Paul says, even if himself or one of the other apostles, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. If somebody comes along and tries to bring a gospel message, which isn't the gospel, if an angel comes to you, and there are some people who have founded cults and false religions who say, I got this from an angel. Paul says if it does not match with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't listen to this. Back a few years ago, I sat down and wrote out a little list of different gospels that are false gospels, things that people have that are sort of Christianish, but it's not the gospel. I've got a list of them here. You may want to make note of some of them. A ceremonial gospel that is based on church rituals and sacraments where people feel as though if they do certain ceremonies, 
that is enough to be saved. That is not the gospel. A moral gospel based on good deeds and a life of kindness where they say, my actions show that I have love for others and that will make me right in God's standing, in God's eyes. That is a false gospel. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ that saves. An inherited gospel based on having Christian parents and saying, I was born into a Christian family. That's what we are, therefore I must be saved. A cultural gospel based on nationality or ethnic heritage. I'm an American. I have this background because we all came from the old country and we all brought along our Bibles, and therefore I must be saved. A spiritualized gospel based on spiritual feelings and experiences. I feel like I'm a very spiritual person, so therefore God must accept me. A social gospel based on efforts to transform society. As long as we reconstruct society to be more fair in some way, to be more just in some way, that's what God would have us to do, and that will make me right with God. A mental health gospel based on psychological insights and personal boundaries. God has established certain things about how I think and feel, and he knows my heart, and therefore I must be saved. A legal gospel based on religious rules and judgments. Provided I maintain these standards, I will be saved. The opposite of that, a libertine gospel based on freedom from God's standards. We're free in God. We can do anything we want. And the more freedom I act to sin, the more I am close to God, some say. An environmental gospel based on oneness with nature. A prosperity gospel based on eagerness for material reward. An aesthetic gospel. I hear this sometimes. People say, I create beautiful art, and I am a creator the way God is a creator. I'm one with him because of all of the quality things that I do. An exper Did someone say that's weird? <laughs> An experimental gospel where you have your own individual beliefs and practices, and you mix them all together and come up with your own gospel blend. A syncretistic gospel, well, that's similar, I guess, where you're mixing beliefs, other beliefs with the gospel in many native cultures Enough of the gospel got there that they'll put some crosses on things and at the same time will have all of their old pagan beliefs and they just mix the two of them together. All of these things would be false gospels. Are you listening, church? It is necessary for us to know the gospel, hold to the gospel, and from year to year, from generation to generation, new versions of false gospels pop up and we say, that isn't the gospel. We don't want to drift into that territory for our church, for our family, for ourselves, for our own hearts. That isn't the gospel. We will want to hold fast to the message of the gospel. And then in the next several parts of our message, I want to talk about aspects of our delivering this gospel message to others. I'll think with you about the preaching of the gospel first. One primary method that God uses for proclaiming his message is preaching. The Lord loves preaching of the gospel. Did you know that? The Lord loves preaching of the gospel. The word preach and preaching appears in the English Bible over 150 times. We find that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. John the Baptist preached of the coming Christ. Jesus preached about entering God's kingdom. The apostles fearlessly preached the gospel. Timothy and other pastors are commanded to preach the word. The gospel will be preached to the whole world until Christ returns. Notice in Matthew chapter 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The Lord loves the preaching of the gospel. As much as he loves this, it's something that Satan hates. It's my understanding that Satan will seek to distort the gospel. That's why you can have so many versions of the gospel that we just went through a minute ago, where people will begin to say, I will keep preaching the gospel, and they get further and further and further off, and Satan says, go ahead, keep doing that. You're getting further and further and further in a good direction, and it gets further and further off instead. Satan will seek to distort it. Satan will cause us to neglect it. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you might. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We 
can look at it in our Bibles. And we'll also, uh, I guess I don't have it on the screen, so we'll just keep it right there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Paul writes to Timothy, a young pastor, he says, Until I come, devote yourselves to the public, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which is given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Let me talk to you about this for a moment. Timothy is called to be a pastor. Timothy is acting as a pastor. You would say, well, surely he will be faithful in preaching the gospel. Paul has to write to him and warn him about not neglecting this preaching of the gospel. Keep doing this. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep doing it in such a way where your hearers will be saved. Why would Paul need to remind Timothy? Why would the Bible have to include this so that I'm reminded of this? Because it is tempting to neglect the preaching of the gospel. I will tell you, and this is something that occurs to pastors, maybe it's occurred to you, you think, people have heard this. If I preach the gospel again, it will seem like some message they've already heard. We ought to go on to something else that's a little bit more... Oh, a little bit more um, in-depth. Something else that's a little bit different that they haven't heard before. There's that temptation. Has everyone heard the message of the gospel? No. Honestly, those who have heard it and received it and love the Lord are thrilled to hear the message of the gospel again. And those who've never heard or understood it need to hear it. And so it needs to be frequently proclaimed again and again and again. And yet Satan would whisper in your ear, in my ear, everyone's heard it, they'll be bored, why talk of this again? There is a temptation to neglect the preaching of God's word. There are also attempts to restrict it. Paul himself is a good example of that. He goes and preaches the gospel and keeps being thrown in jail. Satan is behind that. It's not just people who are doing this. Satan would attempt to cause us to distort the gospel, to neglect the gospel, even to see it restricted in many places. There is a spiritual battle surrounding the preaching of the gospel down to this day because God loves the preaching of the gospel. Satan opposes it. I have here a little list that's going to come next about some of the things that you can do as you are part of a service where the gospel is being preached. Any preaching service that you come into, you have a role in this. It is not one man who has that role and everyone else is passive in it. What is, our, what is our calling when we participate in a service like the one we're in right now? Well, there's several things we do. First, we pray beforehand. We bear a burden for the meeting. Even the night before, our family gets together on Saturday evening and we pray for how the meeting will go. We pray about the message of the gospel going forward. We pray about the people that we know of who are going to be present. Some of them we've heard of that may be coming who do not know Christ. We pray for people we know who are ill or having other troubles that they'd be able to come if God would allow. We pray that there would be freedom that I would have to be really hearing from the Holy Spirit and preaching the gospel. We pray that the heat will work in the room. We pray for all kinds of things when we pray beforehand. To show up to a meeting like this and say, I arrived prayerless and I was depending on others to bear the burden for this isn't a smart idea. We would want all of us to be prayed and ready because there's a spiritual battle that goes on. Pray evangelistically for those who may come. Another thing is we invite others. We ask the Lord, who shall I bring with me to this? Now, I'm not going to tell you that the only method for bringing people to Christ is by bringing them to a preaching service, but it is a method that God loves because he says the preaching of his word is a powerful thing. So you'd say, Lord, who would I be inviting? Who may I bring with me to this meeting? Prepare to listen. When your family arrives... And these are just some practical things. I'm going to get very practical for a minute. When the family arrives, you'd say, well, let's come a few minutes early. Let's not come in partway through. Let's come a few minutes early. And let's see to it that we're able to come and get the children to the bathroom and do the things that will make sure everybody is ready so that we are set when the meeting is ready to begin. A few other practical things. I suggest you sit where you can see and hear. 
occasionally have people who come to me later and they say, well, I couldn't really see very well. I couldn't really hear very well. And I say, there are places closer to the front. You know, I, you know, you sit where you can see, where you can hear, where you can really participate. Turn off the phone and be ready to say, I'm here to focus on what God's word has for us. Have a Bible ready. Help those around you find the place in the Bible. There may be children or newcomers who don't know where they are and they're just sort of flipping randomly. Help them find where we are in the scripture. Say, here's where we're going to be, right here. And then focus. Focus on God's word. Read along in the scripture as it's preached. Take notes. The back of the bulletin has a place to be noting some things. Take that down. You may know this already, but people who write down the things they're learning will remember it far better than those who don't. You say, I have no place to store all these notes. What would I do with them? You can throw it away on the way out the door. Just writing it down causes you to remember it longer than you would if you didn't write it down. Did you understand this? You write down some things, say, Lord, I want to remember this. These are important to remember, and so forth. You can keep it in a file forever, or you can throw it away. It doesn't matter to me, but you will be saying, I want to focus. I want to listen. I want to be learning. This is God's word. Receive God's word. The preaching will be useful to everyone in the room. Now, in different ways. Sometimes you're hearing something preached and say, I already know about this. Ask God, is there a reason this needs to be reinforced in my life? If nothing, I'll say, Lord, this is for someone here. There's someone in this room who needs to be hearing this. I'm going to pray that this will really come through for those who need to hear this. You want to be active in listening and praying for all to have what is being preached received. For the old and for the young, for the experienced and inexperienced, for the believers, for the unbelievers. We want to pray for all who hear. And then finally, reflect on God's word. Meditate on what God's saying, even before you leave. I always suggest, when a service is over, pause for a minute and say, Lord, what was it that you were trying to communicate with me? How can I put that into my heart? Who will I talk to about this after the meeting? It's not the time to have a stampede to get the Fig Newtons. It's the moment to think, what is it? that God is doing in my life. Let that sink in even before you leave. And then as you go home again, think on this. My family and visitors to my home know that on a Sunday afternoon or evening, if we have a meal together, typically I'll ask each one, what is it that you gained from our time together? What was God doing when you were meeting there? Sometimes people will say a certain song ministered to them or something that they talked about with someone or something they heard in the message. I do this not because I'm fishing for compliments about the sermon, but I want people to articulate, this is what God was doing. So it begins to sink in still more. We're talking thus far about elements of the gospel, about the message of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. And then I want to talk with you thirdly about the power of evangelistic prayer. The Bible says that evangelism is spiritual warfare. It's more than an appeal to the human mind because unbelievers' minds are bound or in bondage to the powers of Satan. So if I thought, well, I could get my best oratory skills out, I could get my best debate skills out, I can show someone definitely who Christ is, I'm not against somebody thinking logically and presenting that, but you understand it is a spiritual battle and it's won on spiritual terms. And so there has to be prayer, evangelistic prayer, that goes on with this. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Thinking of Ephesians chapter 6, and here the Apostle Paul is speaking. If anyone was both fearless and fruitful evangelistically, it was Paul. And notice what he says here in Ephesians 6, verses 19 and 20. He says in verse 19, Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The prayer that starts off in terms of this spiritual warfare prayer is prayer for you, the evangelist. Paul says, when I am ready to speak the gospel message, I need people praying for me that I will open my mouth and proclaim it fearlessly. That kind of prayer is a good, effective prayer. And notice the context in which this is taking place. He says, I want you to pray that I will proclaim it fearlessly as I should. 
And the, everything that precedes this is all about spiritual armor, spiritual warfare, the spiritual battle that's going on. And Paul says that spiritual battle is manifested whenever it comes time for me to open my mouth and say something about Christ. Has anyone had the experience of thinking, I ought to share about Jesus with someone, and as you prepare to do that, a wave of fear sweeps over you? A wave of some shyness or confusion? anticipating that there's going to be immediate rejection. You suddenly feel like, maybe I won't say something now. I'll put this off until tomorrow. Surely tomorrow will be a better day. You know what I'm talking about? Now, if the Lord himself says, please keep quiet, share this tomorrow, I'm in favor of obeying the Lord. But that's not usually what happens when a wave of fear sweeps over. Paul says this is a spiritual battle. There needs to be prayer for you, the evangelist. Also, there needs to be prayer for the lost. Looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to read to you here from 2 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 3. The apostle writes, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Note, our spiritual weapons have power. When we pray for those who are lost, Paul says, when you pray and you bring those spiritual weapons in through prayer, there is power. It's not the power that the world understands. It's a different kind of power. There is power in this. And we may pray for individuals even by name and see that God will answer this with power. In prayer, it's proper to pray for the tearing down of the works of Satan, such as false doctrines or unbelief or hatred or fear or despair. You say, God, this person is in bondage. There are these false things that wrap themselves around this dear one. I can see some of it. I'm going to pray and pray for this individual. and I'm going to pray that you will tear down strongholds, satanic strongholds in the life of this individual. Pray for that person's deliverance from the power of and the persuasion of Satan. And from the love of the world and the lust of the flesh, pray that their conscience would be convicted and that they would bring, and that God would bring them to repentance and saving faith. This intercession, interceding for such people, needs to be persistent. You say, why does it need to be persistent? Is it because God doesn't care about this? And the answer is no, that's not it. It needs to be persistent because we have an enemy and it's a battle. Has anyone ever seen a battle won in a few minutes or a few hours? Not usually. Sometimes battles go on for years. In the physical realm, they go on for years with everything being thrown into the battle. There are battles that I have known of that have gone on for years as I have prayed for certain individuals. And then finally, we see victory years later. It's a battle. God's word would tell us we pray for ourselves as evangelists, we pray for the lost and for things that are happening in their lives. And Satan yields only what he must. And then we'll even then renew his attack in subtle ways. So it's our duty to continue to fight for souls for whom Christ died. I'm going to ask you, are you praying for somebody specific? In the past, over the years, I have oftentimes had the Lord lay on my heart someone specific, sometimes somebody who seems very unlikely. And the Lord says, this is a spiritual battle. I want you to take up this one and pray for this one for as long as it takes. And the interesting thing is, if the Lord's the one who lays that on your heart and has you battle through that, there typically is some victory at the end because he's the one who started that battle and said, I want you to see this thing through. Are you praying specifically for someone that God has put on your heart that that one would come to Christ? We've talked thus far about the message of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, the power of evangelistic prayer, and now the power of evangelistic witness. Acts 1.8, you know this text. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. And I want to share with you for a moment, and you've heard this before, about what a witness is. It's, a, it's almost a legal definition. You go to court. And there's somebody who stands up and says, I saw what happened, and therefore I am a witness. Now, a witness is different from somebody who is a, what shall I say? Sometimes there are technical experts that come to a court case, 
and these technical experts come in and say, well, I happen to know all about these things from a technical point of view. Those guys are good too, but witnesses don't generally do this. If there's a car crash, you're not going to be asked whether you know all about traffic safety and whether you know about design of cars and crash test ratings. Nobody's going to ask you about that. They're going to ask you what happened. You'll say the red car hit the blue car. I saw it. Is this right? That's what a witness does. For you to be a witness is simply to say, this is what Christ did in my life. If someone says, how did he do it? Tell all that you know. But if there's things you don't know, you'd say, I don't know. If they say, how does this fit in with people who live in dark corners of Africa? You may have to say, I don't know. If they say, how does this fit in with evolution? You may say, I'm not sure. I'm, I, if, if you know about it, fine. But for you to be a witness is just say, this is what Jesus did for me. Do not let anyone, including yourself, intimidate you about things you don't know. To be a witness, you simply say, a lot I don't know, but I do know this. Jesus did this for me. It reminds me of a man that Jesus healed. The man was blind. The man was dragged in front of the authorities. They said, who did this? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. How did he do this? Well, I'm not really sure. You know, I, was, I was, you know, wasn't seeing it when it happened. You know? And they said, uh, you know, what, what do you say about this guy? Is he a prophet? Is he the Messiah? What do you say? He said, look, I don't know a lot of things. I just know that I was blind, and now I see. What he knew, he could tell them. There was a lot he didn't know. And God honored that. This man was willing to say what he knew. The same thing must be true of us. What we know about what Christ has done in our lives, you can tell it. And that makes you a witness. Why do we want to be a witness, witness and share this with others? In the book of Jude, there's an interesting text. Jude chapter 23, no, Jude verse 23. Let's try that again. Jude verse 23 says the following. Snatch others from the fire and save them. I have an idea that if you were driving along on the way home and saw that a house burst into flames and that there was a child who needed to be rescued from the home and you thought you could reasonably do it without killing yourself, you would do anything you could to rescue that child. I think that's true. You'd get on the phone, you'd be calling authorities, you'd grab a ladder off the back of the truck, you'd climb up and grab the kid out of the window and bring him back down, whatever you could do. Grabbing somebody from the flames and saving that one. The Bible says that we are to be like ones who snatch others from the fire and save them. Knowing this, knowing that as witnesses we are to do this, there are still hesitations. A hesitation people have is fear of rejection. What if I try to do this and someone rejects me? But I want you to understand, this isn't all about you. It's about the one who needs to be saved. If I were interviewing men to become firefighters, I'd say, OK, you're going to be a fireman, and you're going to need to have this big ax, and you're going to smash down people's doors and crash into the house and pull them out and all this sort of stuff. And if the man said, I'm really hesitant to do that. They might get unhappy that I smashed their door in, and you know, I don't know if people reject me and so on, I'd say, he's probably not fit to be a firefighter. It's not about him, it's about what he's been charged to do and how he's going to be rescuing others. Having too much focus on you is a bad idea under these circumstances. So we're warning ourselves, it's not about fear of rejection because it's not about you. And you think, wait a minute, it's not about me, it's about my love for Christ, it's about that this one needs to be saved from eternal hell. Hesitation number two, fear of failure. You say, I won't do it right. I won't see any results. I'll, 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 um, I'll wait for a while and, and be a witness later when I have a more winning argument and so forth. Friends, this isn't about you winning an argument. It's about you being a witness to what Jesus did for you. If the other person chooses to say, I don't want any of that, that is not your responsibility. But it is your responsibility to speak these words of who Christ is and what he's done for you without being afraid of failure because the success has already been won. You've spoken the word of witness, and then it is in the Lord's hands about what happens after that. Do you all understand this? We already learned about this from one of our parables last month. Farmer has seeds. He spreads the seeds around. They fall on all different kinds of soil. And he was not at fault about whether some grew and some did not, or whether they were some that uh, were, oh, you know, uh, choked out and so forth. The Bible just says he scattered them, and then things happened each one. Do you understand that? The way that he would be at fault is if he kept all the seeds in the seed bag and never scattered them. 
in the same way, the only failure we can have is if we fail to share the gospel. A third hesitation. I don't know who to tell. I'm not sure who I could tell about it. It, it, it overwhelms me to think of who I might tell. Well, there's different ways to approach this, of course. One is you can pray and ask the Lord who to tell. Another is you can take a piece of paper out and say, I'm going to make a list of people that I know who I have a reason to think may not be saved. They may be relatives. They may be neighbors. They may be people that you work with or see on a regular basis. You make such a list, you pray for each one, and you ask God to open a way for you to share with someone on that list. This may seem like it's a pretty, um, oh, I don't know, mechanical way of going about it, but I can tell you that we have seen some results over the years with this sort of thing. In some of our hope groups, we've had them say, let's make a little list of all the people that are in our circle, and let's begin praying for those ones. And we've seen a number of those people come to Christ. So you make a little list, you begin praying for those ones. The Billy Graham Association says you can pray in the following way. Lord, open a door. In other words, open some door for me to be able to have communication and contact with someone on this list so that I can share Christ. Lord, open their hearts. Open their hearts wide to be wanting to receive this so that you're doing a work in their lives. And then finally, here comes the big miracle. Lord, open my mouth. Lord, open a door. Lord, open their hearts. Lord, open my mouth. And I'm going to tell you something, and you can look this up with me. In Philemon chapter 6, Philemon's a small book. But I'll give you an extra moment to find it. Philemon chapter 6, you find Hebrews and then verse 6. Philemon verse 6, if you find Hebrews and then go backwards just one, there you are, Philemon verse 6, chapter 1 and verse 6. This is translated slightly differently from one, te- uh, one version to another, but I'll read it here in my Bible. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You want to know and experience the goodness and richness of a life in Christ. You want to feel like you're walking with the Lord and doing what he is doing. He says, the way you're going to do this is you're going to be active in sharing your faith. If you're not active in sharing your faith, something withers and dies. I was recently reading the life of the great sports hero from more than 100 years ago, a man named C.T. Studd, who eventually became one of the Cambridge Seven, going into world missions. And in his own biography, he says that he was saved on hearing the preaching of Dwight Moody. But then, for several years, he was very ineffective as a Christian and was largely backslidden and cared little about Christ. And he said he figured out later why that was true. That he had come to know the love of Christ, but he had shared it with no one else. And in sharing it with no one else, he didn't grow further in his life and it became less and less important to him. Later, he began to share it with others, and the first person that he shared it with who came to Christ, it was like the greatest treasure ever, and he said from then on, all of the sports victories and all that meant nothing to him, and he said, that's where it's at. It's sharing this with others. If you want to know the love of Christ and the joys of his world, sharing your faith with others. Right here it says, Paul writes to this man named Philemon and says, I'm praying that you're going to be active in your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. As it says on the screen, we are unfulfilled until we are active in evangelism. I have people who come to me and say, Pastor, I just feel so listless in my spiritual life, and I don't know, there's nothing. I mean, spiritually, I feel like things are really dead, and probably it's other people's fault. There just isn't enough teaching that I'm receiving and not enough love I'm getting and so forth. And I think, well, maybe we could teach and love you better. But I say, what are you doing to share your faith with others? And the answer invariably is, nothing. You will not be fulfilled in your Christian life, either as an individual or as a congregation. When whole churches stop sharing their faith, the church becomes dried up and they all start to fight with each other. But when you say, we have a job to do, it's sharing our faith with others, and others are being brought to Christ, it is rewarding and wonderful and the church becomes alive. I pray that you will have this fulfillment in your life that only comes by sharing your faith with others. There is power in evangelistic witness. 
And so lastly, we talk about living as witnesses for Jesus Christ. I want to make it clear, you did not choose the place or time of your birth. No one could do that. You were instead born at this era and in this place, or you were brought to this place physically because God brought that together. You and I can see this when we read through the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, and you know he's sold by his brothers and carried off to Egypt and so forth, and you say, well, that's, that's you know, a lot of um, bad things that happened, and yet Joseph could say in the end, listen, he could say, you all may have intended it one way, but God did this, and he meant it for good, and I was brought here in order to save many. Do you remember this? You were brought to this time and place in order to save others. You have a purpose. Do not let it be thought, if only you could go into some faraway place and share Christ, then you could be fulfilled. The faraway place you were sent was here. It was here. Let me help to shape your thinking on this. When I went into an Eskimo village to share the Lord there, I had people from the lower 48 states who said, surely those people really need the Lord. And they did. There was tremendous spiritual need there. Later, I told the Eskimo people I was going to go to Detroit to share the gospel. They said, those people need God. <laughs> they did. I guess they'd seen the news. So, the fact is, wherever God puts you is a place that needs the Lord. He's put you here in this generation, now, so that you may share your faith with others so that you may rescue others. It's no accident. Your life has a purpose. And every person you interact with has immense eternal value. There are no ordinary people that you bump into and say, this person just, you know, has no value. Every single one of them is an eternal soul who needs the things of Jesus Christ. Christian author C.S. Lewis says, quote, it is a serious thing to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. Every person you see, even if they look sort of boring and ordinary, is either one day going to be so glorified that they will be ones that you would be tempted to worship if you saw them today, or will be so awful as one rejected by God in hell that you would say, I would never want to meet such a creature in my nightmares. He's, there's nobody who's just some ordinary guy. Every single one of them is headed toward an eternal destiny. All day long we are in some degree helping each other, helping each other, or helping someone else to one of those destinations. There's nobody who's ordinary. So we want to cultivate relationships. We want to cultivate relationships when I meet people, I ask them about themselves. I might start with some very basic questions. So where are you from? Are you married? Do you have any children? What do you do for a living? We talk about things. I have found that it's not difficult to talk to people because I always talk to them about the thing which is the most interesting thing in the world to them, which is themselves. It's true. I, in that way, I'm a fascinating conversationalist. I, I ask them about themselves, and they are pleased to tell me about things in their lives. I will ask them about spiritual beliefs. People that I don't know, sometimes I don't know their beliefs. Sometimes I can tell rather clearly, even before we start talking, by how they identify themselves, how they dress. I know they belong to a certain religious group. I'll ask them about their spiritual beliefs, and they'll begin to tell me. I will ask them if they'd like to hear what I believe. If they've already talked at some length about what they believe, and if I ask them, would you like to know what I believe? If they say yes, then they usually listen because they've just given permission for me to share with them what I believe and why. I will tell them. I need to be ready to present the gospel, ready to follow up as well. Sometimes I hear from people who say, I had this great talk with somebody. I was in the park. We talked together. I shared the gospel with him. And I say, well, are you going to follow up and uh, find out how he goes? Well, I, I don't know how I would. don't know his name. Didn't get his number. I think, oh, you know, if, if the Lord allows, find a way to follow up on this. And one more thing, and we're getting near the end of our message. 
This is something a Christian family does together. I'm not asking you to leave all of the, um, you know, the spouse and the babies back home and go out and do this alone. Why not find ways that you can do this together as a family? I frequently invite people who don't know the Lord into our home. We have dinner together. We have a little scripture together. We have some prayer together. They get to know that we have certain things that we believe. I invite them into our home. Or perhaps our family will go and do something together. And this transitions. I'm going to wrap up our sermon and go into some of our sharing. That's the end of the sermon right there.